Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 500 people, NVIDIA releases their free sync compatible driver, AMD Radeon 7 updates, Lenovo's latest yoga gunning for the Surface Studio, is GTX 1660 Ti in the works, all that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 500, recorded on January 17, 2019. NVIDIA FreeSync Driver and Radeon 7 updates. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Helm. Take back your email and your own data with Helm, a secure personal server that enables you to own your online identity. For a limited time, save $50 off the Helm personal server by visiting thehelm.com slash twitch. And by Hover. Register a domain name with Hover and build your online brand today. Visit Hover.com slash 10 years to take advantage of their 10th anniversary sale, including $10.coms and $10 small mailboxes. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most delightful, most engaging, most powerful, most power efficient, most crazed, unhinged internet of delete expletive we can bring you each and every week. But this week, let us talk about gaming performance, GPUs, and assorted leftover mayhem from CES 2019. I'm Patrick Norton. Joining me I'm today, Sebastian. ladies. Oh, early. <laughs> no, that was fine. It was good. It was good. We're working out. It's a flow thing. It's, you know, so many co-hosts in the last month. We've stabilized now indefinitely, we hope. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is apparently, thank you, Burke, for the cupcake, our 500th episode. My question is, is Burke going to eat the cupcake? Is Kevin going to eat the cupcake? Or will, like, Leo eat the cupcake? <laughs> <laughs> hope everybody made a wish. Oh, my goodness. So the, the rumors... We're starting at CES, and then people said, no, 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 it wasn't a rumor. It actually was an official announcement, and now you have an official actual driver. Uh, so NVIDIA uh, has a an actual G-Sync compatible driver, or is this a FreeSync compatible driver? Since I think part of that title was cut off by the gods of Google Sheets. Uh, I'm trying to think of the actual wording here, whether it's just any kind of adaptive sync uh, well, GeForce people are, driver, are trying this out with any kind of free sync monitor out there, which it is, it is enabled as long as the monitor has that capability and is at the correct setting. Yeah, right. I mean, it's funny because in between uh, Jensen, uh, you know, arguing about free sync being a, a giant pile of dung. FreeSync, unlike G-Sync, does not add a hundred dollar VIG to the cost of your monitor and is, is therefore uh, been included in what I think is a vastly larger pool of monitors. And now we have an actual collection of G-Sync compatible monitors. And then as of 417.71, uh, the latest GeForce driver, um, we have uh, G-Sync capable Pascal and Turing Bridge GPUs can work with FreeSync and, quote, other non-G-Sync variable refresh rate displays. So right now, NVIDIA is uh, certifying 12 FreeSync monitors, but they're saying uh, any variable refresh rate display is going to be able to uh, manually enable G-Sync and then decide if, quote, I'm quoting uh, Jim Tannis here over at PC Player, the quality of the experience is acceptable. Uh, yes. And it varies. It varies from model to model. There's no doubt about that. And one of the things that we saw at NVIDIA's uh, CES display for the G-Sync compatible monitors, they had a couple of examples of monitors that didn't meet their whatever their proprietary internal criteria is because they weren't sharing their testing methodology with us. But uh, there, there was one, there was one that was blinking badly. There was one that had really bad ghosting. And some of the comments that I've seen, you know, I've saw a complaint that, Oh my, you know, you know, brand X monitor here is blinking really badly when I enable this or some other comments, but essentially it's going to vary from monitor to monitor. They're not certifying anything. You can do it with any monitor that supports uh, variable refresh as long as you're on a Pascal or Turing card. And that was something that I guess, even though it was originally announced, there was some expectations that it might be enabled down the road on Maxwell or other uh, previous generation cards from NVIDIA. And apparently that's been clarified, at least in like the support forums where 
they said, no, we have no plans of supporting Maxwell. So it really is just 10 series and and the new 20 series cards that can enable this. And you have to make sure that your monitor has uh, is in the correct mode. That was one thing that was a little bit of a like if you've owned a NVIDIA GPU, you've had no reason to have your monitor in that mode before. Uh, and it's one of those things where as people kind of like learn what the right settings are and whether their monitor works or not, they can enable this and have a better experience. Or they might be looking at, you know, a possible upgrade to that display, but they don't necessarily have to go G-Sync because this is now enabled with the new driver version 417.71. So it's just more flexibility. And the whole idea behind this is would theoretically be just to offer the potential for a better gaming experience for anybody who has a VRR capable monitor. So, and I, I think that they were careful to frame this and video was careful to lay the groundwork by saying, Hey, we've only certified 12 as being a great experience, but you know, your <laughs> mileage may vary. I thought it was curious that not a single uh, Dell monitor, given that Dell sells more monitor, but monitors than anybody else in the United States. There are no Dell or Alienware monitors on there, even though they've had a fair number of uh, FreeSync compatible monitors in the last couple of years. I, uh, I'm curious. I like the fact that, uh, you know, once again, Reddit has turned its power to good <laughs> to make this a an easier experience for most people. Have you guys had, to, had time to play around with this? Because I realized I just sent my last FreeSync compatible monitor back to the manufacturer. And I was like, oh, I could have tested this. I I have one that's in the box. I can almost see it over there. So I will be dragging that out and connecting it as soon as I'm done with some uh, GPU testing that I'm doing to follow up on that original uh, RTX 2060 review I have. So many benchmarks, so little time. Can you can you reveal any thoughts on how the, the the next round of RTX testing is going, or would you prefer to save that for the article on PC Per and uh, some of discussion? It's, at this point, it's just some of it's just raw data at this point. I've got to actually chart it out to look. I'll, I'll do like quick one two comparisons, but then it gets completely lost in my mind as I run more and more benchmarks at different resolutions on different cards, and then I can't remember. And so it's actually kind of fun for me when I make the charts because that's when I like, oh, look, that's where that one places next to this card because I right. it, it becomes overwhelming. So we'll have to, I'll, I'll be as surprised as anybody else when I actually write this up. And I've, I've been combining <laughs> it with uh, overclocking testing, too, just to complicate things because and just an early preview of that, my uh, Founders Edition 2060 card. Uh, I know Kyle over at Hardo CP had his at uh 2055, like 2055 megahertz. Wow. And I got mine to sustain that it goes in 15 megahertz increments. I got mine to sustain just over that at 2070. And I've been working on sort of validating that as a stable overclock, but it seems to be so far. And that's with a 500 megahertz memory overclock too. So then I guess not the, a bad the next big arm. question is it overclocks and then how does the, you know, how does the actual work performance scale as you overclock the the gpu on that right yeah that's what i have yeah. to chart out and figure out here the fun part i I'm was uh, so excited when i saw the the article another jim tannis article from pc per he he wrapped up sort of the press release from a t where they're like here's the radeon 7 benchmarks i'm like yeah and then i realized yes. you know they're not <laughs> comparing it to a 2080 2070 2060 1080, 1070, 1070 Ti. They're comparing it to uh, AMD's very own Radeon RX Vega 64, which, of course, um, you you can then sort of extrapolate back based on the performance of the Vega 64, how it's going to compare to NVIDIA cards. Um, but I think the short answer is it's faster anywhere from, I want to say, like 20 to, in some bench, I'd say probably about 20% faster, maybe in one or two benchmarks is, as much as... Uh, you know, 30, 40% faster, it looks like. Yeah. The the averages that, that Jim figured were around, as he says, 29% in games kind of yeah. aggregate and 30% overall in professional apps. So, I mean, those are big gains. And what I had seen with the Vegas 64 so far is that it wasn't really competing with the uh, new RTX 20 series parts from NVIDIA. So if this... 
is providing that kind of a boost, then I, I think it can absolutely flirt with RTX 2080, which has the same MSRP. We're talking about right. the battle between two $700 graphics monsters. So <laughs> I don't want to say that doesn't matter to all of us, but I, I, I want to say it matters to fewer of us than we might like. That's just a lot of money for a GPU. Um, it is. I, I, You're getting a lot of memory, so maybe if this is right. simply for like professional uses. I know we talked about this a little bit last week, I think, but it's it's interesting to have that much high bandwidth memory, but it doesn't seem to be as... Well, just based on these benchmarks that they've released, it's not like blowing away the performance of the last gen. It's, it's you know, 20, 30% faster. Right. I mean, I'm... I'm I'm sitting here, and it's amazing to see more so in the 2080 Ti and the 2080, but the spread of prices on these cards are anywhere, you know, $1,500 for a water-cooled MSI GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, uh, which is not hugely up. Uh, we got some $1,300 2080 Ti's. And then the actual 2080s are anywhere from $970 down. Is there anything actually 870 860 and I keep checking these because I was I was laughing that the prices fluctuated a bunch over CES week. Eight twenty nine. We're almost eight nineteen and eight oh ten. Eight ten. There it is. There's one, two. Oh, three. Oh, two seven ninety nine cards and a couple of cards that are ten bucks under uh, MSRP. <laughs> We're talking twenty eighties here. Well, I'm actually talking 20. Oh, here's a 2080 for $759.99. That's after a $20 rebate. Yeah, these are all, there mm. actually are some 2080s down on the $750 range uh, from Newegg, not from sort of random sources on the internet. Oh, yeah. Huh. I think it's, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty clear why every time uh, I know Jacob over at uh, EVGA will tweet out that they're about to get new graphics cards in stock and they'll be gone like two minutes later because they sell at MSRP <laughs> direct. And every right. time I've ever gone, I know last generation when I was looking for a card and you just couldn't find them because of the mining craze. And then I would go like, oh, he tweeted out, I should go. It, no, it was already gone. <laughs> In seconds. Yeah, like yeah before I, I, I could log into the computer like two feet away from me, it was gone. Hate that. So, it, you know, it's, it's nice to see that the cards are available. Not all of them, but... And we're actually seeing cards for under MSRP, which is just such a strange and wondrous feeling at this point after last year. Um, AMD supplies, well, I should say AMD Scott uh, Herkelman uh, has not been supplied, uh, but he was talking Radeon 7 with hard OCP. What did he have to say about it? It was interesting. I mean, he went into some details. I read through this uh, review that Kyle at hard OCP had with him. And he talked about kind of like Radeon's position, like the Radeon 7's position, and just, but interesting for, you know, people interested in computer hardware specifications and that sort of thing. They didn't go into a lot of detail at the presentation at CES. So he was getting some clarification on like HDMI standard. And it turns out that the Vega 7 will in fact be an HDMI 2.0 card, not 2.1. And for those features, uh, you're, they're talking about like a possible like a uh, Display port, like an active adapter, but they haven't really committed to that being a product. It's it is indeed going to be a dual eight pin. It is going to be like a three hundred watt max power draw part. So uh, the the interview was interesting because he he goes into kind of a little bit more in depth on their strategy and a little bit more into the roadmap. For the coming year, a different interview with their uh, CEO, Mark Papermaster, actually, that was on the street, uh, had had made the statement that, you know, 2019, there will be a full Radeon refresh across the board. That news came out, I think, the day we recorded our last podcast. I think I wrote news up about it on Friday. And he was oh, not fine. specific about what architecture that would be. Like, is this all going to be like the Vega seven variants like vega 20 stuff or is this going to be you know something else and mm -hmm. so in this hard ocb interview he uh scott herkelman does commit to like that new platform vega 20 being the basis of future products this year so there will be more to see than just one uh flagship 
like seven hundred dollar graphics card, which is nice. Another story came out this week uh, talking about you know looking forward, forward looking news. Uh, yes. The crew over at VideoCards.com quote: We have received a word from a board partner about upcoming Turing based GeForce graphics card, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1660 Ti. Not 2060 Ti, but 1660 Ti. Um, yeah. They heard that name from two sources. Uh, quote three, including the source of the picture you just saw scroll by if you're watching the video right now. Um, a Turing-based card under the GTX brand. You know, basically they strip the ray tracing out and just hurl your basic 3D uh, at the part. 1536 CUDA cores. Uh, it'll be slower than a 2060 uh, if that number is accurate. But they're also claiming it'll still have GDDR6 memory, 192-bit bus. So is this the $200 card that everybody was whining about the, the 2060 not being? Somehow I don't, I don't know. First of all, the, the, I couldn't reconcile myself to the 1600 series branding. But then it was pointed out to me that yeah. they're, they're, they could be concerned legitimately about confusion between RTX and GTX branding with the same series. I don't think they've done that. Like I, I have to go all the way back to like the eight and nine thousand series cards. I think when the GTX branding was first introduced, like the eighty eight hundred GTX and there was the eighty eight hundred Ultra GTX. At that point, was like it, it was a brand that represented a level of performance, and then the GTX line for years now has represented their mainstream like desktop graphics solutions. So to introduce RTX and and brand that as like the future of gaming and ray tracing, I, I was expecting possibly even with the 2060, we'd have a part that wasn't ray tracing enabled, but it is, but it's a higher performing part and is right. more expensive than you'd expect from a mainstream graphics card. So if they go down to 1660, uh, that's where I would see that 250 ish dollar range, especially like a TI model. I'd expect a TI to be a little bit more. Well, if we look historically, like the, the 1050 TI is not an expensive card. It's one of those cards that doesn't even require external power going back to like that first Maxwell card, right. the 750 TI. So it's possible. I mean, this could be their lower power variant for sure. And I'm a little curious about that assertion that it'll be on GDDR6 memory at the same 192 bit memory bus. So it'll, you have a little bit of a different configuration, different graphics core. And, you know, who knows? The clock speeds could be different. <laughs> These could even be higher clocks to maybe make up for that, that deficit in cores going down to 1536 from 1920. So it'll be, it would be curious to see how this stacks up against the 2060. And like you said, like if this gets closer to that two hundred dollar mark, then suddenly we're talking about, well, here is their mainstream graphics card. Because as you went down the the chain from the top end RTX cards, you weren't. I wasn't expecting them to enable ray tracing all the way down because at some point it just doesn't make sense with regard to the performance level of the card. Like it, it just, you know, it, the new Port Royal benchmark. We were talking about this last night. Right. It it can bring the 2080 Ti to its knees where it can't sustain 60 frames per second. It's actually averaging somewhere around 37, 38. So there's no way I would expect a mid-range card to be doing, you know, full-on ray tracing in games. So to me, this made sense. Like they'd come out with some kind of a product minus ray tracing on the new core uh, at the same process. This is still a 12 nanometer according to this rumor. So... It's new touring stuff, just minus ray tracing, and hopefully that mainstream price that people want to see. So when you say mainstream price, are you talking about a two hundred dollar card, a two hundred fifty dollar card at that point? Uh, yeah, I guess. Okay, I'm, I I might be a little out of touch because I'm thinking mainstream to me is two fifty, two hundred two fifty. Okay. Whereas a lot of well, people probably spend less for like that budget build. I'm thinking like sure. 1080p gamer who has a couple hundred dollars to spend on a graphics card. It was, it was interesting because some of the comments we had on, on one of the videos we posted for tech thing, uh, one of the YouTube comments was, you know, this is a $200 card. It should be selling for, and you know, it was, it was interesting to me because I, on one hand, I understand that people feel that, uh, you know, the 2060 
because it's, you know the tw- it's the next generation 1060. It, it should be less expensive. And I started digging through the cost of cards, um, both the MSRP, uh, or I should say the MS, like the launch MSRP. And all I could think was, you know, when a 1060, yeah, when it came out, the launch price was 249, 299 for the Founders Edition. The 1070 Ti was like 449. I want to say the 1070 was was 350, 400. And it was really interesting to me to to hear people being really angry that they had the audacity to label a 2060 part with a $350 price tag. And then the claims was also, well, it doesn't outperform the previous generation cards. And I was just like, you know, and then, of course, the, the litany of, you know, they went to the show and they drank the Kool-Aid because they love NVIDIA more than they love us. And, and as sort of YouTube comment threads kind of tend to spiral down to the most depressing interpretation of, of whatever they're examining. But, you know, you look at a, you know, a GTX 1070, that was selling for 379 uh, You've got 1070 Ti to 1080 performance out of the 2060. You've got a $349 price tag. You've got tremendous availability on the GPUs, on Newegg and other sources. It seems like this is a card where the price is going to come down. And then, you know, we also haven't seen the 2050, which is promising, you know, if, if this if this sort of, you know, performance number name game keeps on with NVIDIA, you know, if there's a 2050, which there's no reason not to expect, although I'm with you at some point, it's, you know, you can do RTX ray tracing at 800 by 600. And it's like, Why? 640 by 480. We had, you know, playable frame rates. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was I was really, it was interesting because the other thing is that people are like, oh, you don't know what a 1080 Ti costs. And I was like, well, I was on Newegg the day I wrote that article and there was a bunch of, you know, 1080 Ti's right now. I think mostly because they're at that, that end of life, right? When you look at, at televisions, for example, they tend to sort of hit at the MSRP. And then over the course of the life cycle and months and months and months, they tend to drop down to their lowest price. Usually, oddly enough, somewhere between May and Black Friday, around Black Friday, they tend to hit their lowest price. And yeah. then they they sort of, you know, burble around that price. And then magically, as the supply dries up and people are like, I wanted that television. I can't wait till June. It's February. Um, the prices have, have shot back up, you know, for one last little bit before the next generation TVs come out. But when you're looking at... 1070 Ti's, which are performing similar to the 2060, the 2060 is performing similar to a 1080, uh, 1070 Ti. You're yeah. looking at you know 570, 519, 499, 499. Like, you know the cheapest 1070 Ti right now is 439 dollars. So if you're comparing, you know if you're looking at performance, you're absolutely getting better performance. You know, than than the previous 1070 Ti out of a 2060 part. It's it's curious to, for me. I think everybody wants a you know everybody wants to pay less. Um, you know, I was also really excited to see how many 2060s are shipping right now. Uh, you know, and I don't know how much of this is because the first card in the long list of 2060 parts looks like a sub 220 millimeter card that'll fit in my ITX case, uh, or it's because I've been waiting so long for the 2060s to show up. Um, you know, but they're, you know, there's, there's some selling for as high as like, you know, 390 to $420, but there's a tremendous number of $350 parts out there that are available, which, uh, always makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like you know, it when it, the cards are actually for sale. And the, like you were talking about pricing, like when the, and it's, I didn't realize how long it had been. It's been a, it was a year and a half between the launch of the 1060 and the 2060, and in that year and a half, the performance of the, you know, X060 card doubled. Right. And the price went up 100 bucks. And so to me, that actually is a pretty good value proposition. I think the, the name of the card has caused some confusion because, like you said, with the expectation about, about price, people see, oh, it's the 2060, it's a $200 card. Well, they're thinking of the 960, which launched at 199. The 1060 right. was 249, so it was a little bit of creep, but a little bit, obviously, a higher performance level, much higher performance level from the 960 to the 1060, six gigabyte. And then with the 2060, it's so much more performant that it really, I think, deserves a name to indicate that this is this is more than just a 60 card in our series. It reminds mm-hmm. me of if you can throw your mind back to. The 500 series, 
uh, one of the, <laughs> the cards that I bought in that era was a GTX. This is a very strange product that existed for a while. A GTX 560 Ti 448. And you can Google that if you're watching, but the, the 560 <laughs> Ti had a different core than the 570, but the 560 Ti 448 used the same core as the 570, a uh, partially cut down version of it, but with with a little bit of overclocking, you basically got the performance of a 570 with the 560 Ti 448, which is a very strange product, and near the end of the life of the 560. The, the 2060 comes out using the same core as the 2070, uh, slightly lower performance uh well you know it, one step down in performance because of portions of that gpu being disabled but same memory type and you know with some overclocking you can bridge the gap between those two i'm not saying you can do it completely there is a significant loss of memory bandwidth there but it was just interesting to me to see like this is this almost was the 2060 ti that we got first so now <laughs> almost if this yeah, almost. So that's another reason I was scratching my head with the 1660 Ti rumor we just talked about. Well, it's and it's I I almost feel like I want to give them credit because the the card you were talking about the you know the 500 series the 488 and the, you know, there was the point where I remember like Ryan could keep all of the cards straight in their performance and their numbers, but it was one of the most frustrating experiences you would have trying to explain to people like, you know, well, the new, you know, I can't remember what series it was, but it was like a 900 series card, but it performed considerably lower than the less expensive previous generation card. And having to explain that to people because, you know, they were jerking around names and numbers to, uh, well, you know, to sell cards, which I guess is kind of the point uh, <laughs> of, of selling cards. But, I, I feel that the current arrangement is is much less frustrating. Um, although doing the whole 1660 jive might make it a little more complicated. But even that seems much more manageable and, and thoughtful than being like, it's the 2059.999999 or it's the, you know what I mean? It's Yeah. As, hey, as long as the lower numbers have lower performance, and I guess it makes sense. So if the 1660 is less than 2060, that should be self-evident, right. I guess. But then there's the whole RTX versus GTX thing, and who knows? Who knows if those are accurate, but... <laughs> who knows you know, if these rumors will interesting eventually prove months. true. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, you know, I, I, to, to video card's credit, they, they, you know, they did appear to get an advanced copy or reviewer's guide, uh, and they... You know, probably in violation of many NDAs, um, but the information they released was accurate and, and showed up Sunday night before CES. So, who knows yeah. if this information is as good? Uh, we could find out. Well, well, I don't know. We don't know when though. We didn't get a date at our launch. Product. No, that was the one uh, thing in the report was ship no date. launch date set, anything like that. So, as we get closer, it seems like, and and video cards is a good track record. Um, and they, as we get closer to a launch, when actual products exist, we're going to start seeing those leaked, like box right. renders and that sort of thing. So they we're early days with this. Early days. Sounds so desperate. <laughs> I know. Well, there's just, we need more stuff. We need, like, uh, the Pascal stuff is starting to kind of dry up in the market. And the 20 series is out there, but people want that sort of mainstream card, which they don't have yet. So soon, soon as those, soon as those 20 or AMD jumps in and fills the gap, who knows, you know, we wait with bated breath. <laughs> this episode of this week in our computer hardware is brought to you by Helm. Helm believes that you have the right to live on your own terms, including online. It's kind of a wild concept. That's why they created a personal server that allows you to easily own and manage your online identity, starting with your email, your calendars, and your contacts. Do you know where your email is stored? Is your email personal and private and the kind of thing you just don't want to share with humanity, or at least humanity outside of the person you sent the email to? Your most critical data contacts, calendar details, and sort of massive corporate servers outside of your home, leaving you vulnerable to hacks and surveillance. I won't talk about the latest hack 
this morning, but let's just say a lot of people's passwords are floating in the breeze right now, at least if the breeze could be on a database on the internet, freely accessible. Connect Helm to your home network, gain uncompromising personal data privacy and security, feel safe and secure online wherever you are in the world, knowing your data is no longer in the cloud, but right where it should be with you. Communicate with confidence, free from the threat of hacking, corporate data aggregation, and government surveillance. Helm is engineered to secure, protect, and give you control of your data. With secure boot, full disk encryption, encrypted offsite backups with private security key, secure enclave from NXP, TLS certificates from Let's Encrypt, and proximity-based two-factor authentication, server-to-server encryption over TLS, signed firmware updates, firmware updates through encrypted VPN tunnels. They've got a professional security audits. They've got bug bounties, recovery key, so backups are only accessible to you. Full disk encryption with keys managed by a secure enclave. Helm's easy to set up. It's simple to manage. If you've ever set up an email server, this isn't like that. you got a three-minute setup. You can access your Helm anywhere in the world. DMARC, SPF, DKIM, email authentication. you got 120 gigabytes of storage. It's solid state for speed. Five terabytes of expandable storage. Free shipping, a one-year warranty, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Privacy is a right, people, not a setting. Protect what matters with Helm. For a limited time, save $50 off the Helm personal server by visiting thehelm.com slash twitch. But don't wait. This offer is only valid for a limited time. That's thehelm.com slash twitch. And we thank Helm for their support of this weekend computer hardware. Do you ever worry about where your data is, Sebastian? <laughs> yes. Or remembering <laughs> where my data is. It's the other problem. Oh, my goodness. That was actually one of my... Uh, we talk about it on uh, on Tech Thing next week, but uh, SanDisk uh, has a new service. They give you a free year with sort of uh, uh, the if you buy a new USB 3.1 uh, flash drive, uh, SanDisk Ultra Flash Drives or the Ultra Fit Flash Drives, um, Ultra Fit ones are the little tiny ones that like my cat likes to steal. They put an identifying kind of bit inside of that that works with their flashback servers. And as soon as you plug it into your machine, it automatically starts backing up the card. And then it's available online from anywhere you have an internet connection, all of the cards you own. And then you can search the content of all of the cards, or you can download or you know create a shareable link for the content. So I just was like, this is, this is shiny and pretty and easy to use, and it makes me happy. Now, please add that to all of my giant collection of uh, SD cards from my camera that have gigabytes of photos from uh, from CES this week, so I can get them off my desktop. Um, you got? Did you do the review of the HyperX Cloud Mix? I did. Yeah, or? this is something I had uh, for CES that I, I hadn't released yet. And then, of course, there's all the CES news and that sort of thing. So, just went up, I think, a few days ago. And. Uh, this is, I, I called it like a tale of two headsets. To me, this is basically two products in one because it's, they, they market it as, the actual name of the product is the HyperX Cloud Mix wired gaming headset plus Bluetooth. Like a plus sign and then Bluetooth. So it, it is legitimate, you know, gaming, zero latency, analog connection with Y cable accessory and a detachable boom mic and all that stuff that you'd expect from a gaming headset. And this is like kind of a no frills or not going like RGB. It's just performance. And then it also has the high res certification because it has Aptex Bluetooth support and very, very good wireless sound quality. And of quite a long battery life too. It's rated at 20 hours, but that's at 50% volume. And there's good enough isolation from these uh, with the ear cup design and the padding that I ended up listening below 50% a lot of the time because it was plenty oh, loud wow. enough. And I was getting longer than 20 hours on a charge. So very impressed with the wireless performance of these. One interesting note, like if you look at the rest of the HyperX lineup, and I've done a different cloud gaming headset in the last few months, when they did their first wireless one, the Cloud Flight, I think it was called, last spring or summer. And that was like a standard 2.4 gigahertz uh, dongle style. But that one uh, has a little bit of a different sound than this one. And compare it to the other headsets in their lineup, this one's actually using 
40 millimeter drivers. Mm -hmm. So kind of that, the same thing we saw from Logitech when they went with their Pro G driver that they introduced a few years ago. A smaller right. driver with a bigger magnet and a little bit better control of the whole frequency spectrum. Different Probably more X Max to get the low end. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, different driver design, though, or not different um, enclosure design. Like it's it's a deep, pretty deep ear cup mm -hmm. that is ported. So they're it's interesting. Like they, these have a lot of low end. You think you were listening to 50 millimeter drivers, and then they still have good balance across the rest of the spectrum. Like they still have good clarity. It's a warmish mid range, but it's 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 neutral enough that these are equally suited to music or entertainment. So not just that really bass heavy uh, sound that you hear from some gaming headsets and they're absolutely not thin on sound either. But I also found them to be pretty light. These are comfortable headphones like with, with the head, with the uh, microphone attached, you're still talking like 12 ounces, I think. Nice. So not real heavy, very soft uh, ear pads. So it brought joy to your skull. <laughs> it did. I ended up walking around listening to just my phone wirelessly with this, just listening to music. And I have, uh, I've been using an Android phone for a while now, and I have developer options enabled. And one of the glorious things you can do, and I have a See picture of it in review, beating your is, headphones with. <laughs> yeah, it's, you can just on the fly change Bluetooth codec so I can hear the difference instantly between AAC, Aptex, go back to SBC. And it is a significant difference. It kind of reaffirms what I already thought about Aptex, just subjective listening in the past. But when you compare them side by side, it, this makes a huge difference. So the price tag of these headphones start to make a little bit more sense when you think of them as a high-res certified Aptex wireless pair of headphones for $200 MSRP. I, I made also a wired gaming mercilessly about high res certification um yeah <laughs> is that just means it plays music um and doesn't suck i mean or yeah should i mean because i've heard some high res headphones where i was just like wow somebody really hated vocals tuned to this headphone because the it was a big v mix where there was too much yeah. bass you, i guess what i mean is generally speaking the high res certification does not always mean the performance you would hope out of something it said high res uh Audio. Yeah, I need to look into what actually allows them to certify. Is this just like a thing where you buy into it and get it? Is it like a THX certification used to be or what? But uh, I wonder if it's just because these have the Aptex capability, although it does not specify Aptex HD. So <laughs> I thought that's what it well, was. I thought it was Aptex HD got you the high res certification, but... Yeah, it's, it, you also have to be careful because there's like a Japanese Audio Society version of high res certification. But um, where is it? I literally had a link to that. Yeah, basically, uh, in order to carry the high res audio logo on their packaging, headphones need to produce an upper frequency of at least 40,000 hertz. <laughs> oh. So they need to produce a frequency that cannot be heard, but perhaps can be experienced yes. some other way. Uh, that's that's uh, that's part of the reputation of high res audio files. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I, I am one of them, but I, I do find it a little bit debatable. Like I've heard some really, really good headphones that only claim to go up to like, you know, 30 or 35,000 hertz. So, you know, the, the thing is, though, is, you know, once you get into your 30s, you're probably lucky if you can hear 17 or 18. By the time you're in your 40s, most people are at 15 max. By the time you're in your 70s, it's uh, painfully low. But the reality is, is most music doesn't exist in terms of the, the, the primary frequency of the instruments above 11,000 hertz uh, yeah. you know, or 11K hertz. And that's uh, now if you want to believe that you need, you know, third, fourth, and fifth order harmonics that are inaudible to the human ear to correctly create something that's better, uh, then by all means go buy the $3,000 super tweeters. But uh, yeah, I remember it, it being, there's a lot less to the, uh, you know, it doesn't, I don't even think, I'll, I'll have to dig some more, but I'm not even sure they specify 
the dB level of the 40,000 hertz signal. <laughs> yeah, isn't that fun? Like when you look at speakers, they very often do show you that dB range. And I've, I don't think I've ever seen it with headphones. Like there, uh, there's, there's probably a lot of high end headphones to it. It's the yeah. dB range isn't particularly useful, especially on a lot of speakers, because if they just say 30 hertz to 25,000 hertz, well, you know, in the case of a, a better speaker uh, will give you like 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, negative 3 dB or, or negative 1 dB, where that right. entire collection of frequency, that, that, that spectrum, it has to be within 1 dB, um, or it can't drop more than one dB. I've seen speakers that claim to go down to 46 hertz, but they were down 6, 8, 12 decibels at 46 hertz once you saw the actual charts for them. So it's, uh, you know, yeah. it's like they're like, fire <laughs> they're like, please place these speakers directly up against a rear wall, please. Yes. <laughs> to, to simulate that lower end extension that we are offering. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even want to go down that. Um, yeah, I, I also, I, I got to say, I, I was a little confused that, that HyperX kind of is licensing or, or uh, building their own variation of uh, Odyssey's Mobius headset. Uh, I want to say the Cloud S. Um, yeah, we talked about that last week. But uh, yeah, the HyperX basic cloud gaming headset um, is a pretty fantastic piece of kit for the money. They do a lot of really nice headsets. Um, that won't leave you feeling emotionally traumatized uh, once you hear a, a better sound. You know, there's just it, they're good. They do good work. They do. So uh, Fison was talking about PCI Express Gen Four by Four NVMe. What uh, what's the story on that in terms of possible real world performance? Well, it was they made it possible at CES, and I I could have sworn we talked about this last week, but I guess not. Um, so I put it in there just in case, but they, <laughs> they had bridged a, used like a test device from a company called PLDA that allowed them to take PCI Express Gen 3 by 16 and then like convert it down to PCIe 4 by 8. And obviously we don't have any PCI Express uh, Gen 4 on the in the desktop world yet. AMD said they will be the first to desktop with that. But uh, just with this kind of experimental setup, they were showing that they were getting over 4 gigabytes per second reads and like 4.1 was what they claimed uh, gigabytes per second with writes. They were actually, their little test showed they were getting over 4,200 megabytes per second with writes. But it is promising to me to see even at this very early stage taking advantage of just the added uh, capability of Gen 4. Because right now, the fastest drives are already kind of hitting the ceiling with PCIe Gen 3. And, I, you know, theoretically, of course, you could release a part for desktop that has more lanes. But with the M.2 form factor, you're limited to four lanes. And... So like for laptop users, they're, they can't go any farther until the generation uh, uh, bumps up to Gen 4 and laptop parts, which I'm sure won't happen until probably the end of the year. But just interesting to see. Here's a company already that says, look, we have a controller. We have Flash that can consistently deliver well above PCI Gen 3 limitations. So when that Gen 4 desktop part hits, then they're offering their controller as a, an option for that early, you know, adopter, high speed alternative for NVMe storage. So it was just interesting that they were showing it, you know, in action at CES and, and using this like bridged solution to make it possible. Hmm. The, uh, I don't know, it, it's, do you feel that most users are going to be able, I, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I love that there's NVMe drives in, in, for example, the Dell XPS I'm using, but I don't think I have the processor power to work with the file sizes that are actually going to take advantage of NVMe performance most of the time. Or is this just as we're, you know, especially in like laptops, we're just sort of pushing the higher specs downward as we start advancing uh, the high-end performance for the desktops again. Yeah, I think that's fair. Because right? laptops, 
like you said, like the, the bottleneck is probably CPU long before it becomes storage when you're dealing with storage of this performance level. And when you have storage already in laptops that can top 3,000 megabytes per second, theoretically, and then managing a lower power CPU with, you know, lower frequencies and generally lower core counts, that significantly cuts down on what you can actually do with files and sustained writes and reads that would actually push your SSD to that performance. Plus, then there's the whole, there is a bit of a thermal issue in smaller spaces with uh, very high speed SSDs mm -hmm. over longer sustained reads and writes where the SSD controller manages it, but it will eventually clock itself down to manage it over the course of a longer read or write. So that's another concern. But just having the the extra wide lanes, while in theory will will affect laptop users, I when I actually have to come back down to earth and think about like the practical limitations of laptop and where we are right now, then maybe we won't be seeing the full benefit of Gen 4 for another year. And <laughs> You know, I mean, we could we could have parts next year that are pushing six, seven thousand megabytes a second, uh, right. if there are enough channels and uh, fast enough uh, interface speed to the NAND. But you know, on on laptop especially, I doubt we will see much over like four gigabytes a second anytime soon. Probably a reasonable reasonable expectation at this point. I don't think we mentioned the Lenovo Smart Clock last week, did we? No. <laughs> um, there was a lot of Internet of Stuff. I, pardon the dead space. Uh, I, I was trying Internet to Internet of Stuff, not I say, do like that. Oh. Yeah, well, there's a Twitter feed that's not Internet of Stuff, but is... Uh, oh, yes, I think I know the one you're talking about. Which is, uh, on its good days, utterly magnificent, but... It was it, it was curious, right? Uh, General Electric had a exhaust hood with a 27 inch Android powered uh, glass covered flat panel that worked as a Google Assistant. Uh, on a more practical note, Google Assistant's finally showing up on the Sonos devices. It is going to be in sound bars from JBL and LG, so that when you're not playing movies, you can ask uh, your Google Assistant to play whatever on your sound bar, and you don't have to fire up, you know, your home theater screen. But what we also saw is, is I really, really liked, uh, you know, we looked at it last year and, you know, I really, really liked that big one you're looking at on the right is, uh, you know, the Lenovo smart display and the little one on the left is their new smart clock. And it's amazing how much difference a little bit of thought can go into uh, or how much difference a little bit of thought can make. For example, as ridiculous as this sounds, is not only is it incredibly, it's really, really, it, 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 the, the screen will pretty much dim to invisible, which is fantastic if uh, you have a light sleeper in the bedroom with you. But, for example, if you need to stop the alarm clock or you want to snooze the alarm clock, you can just tap the top of, of the smart clock. And you may be thinking, well, duh. Um, but if you've heard stories of people having to talk to their smart devices to get them to turn the alarm off or to change something, uh, it can be really, really frustrating and or, or just really, really unnatural or just really, really if, – if you have a – if you sleep with someone who's a deep sleeper and it's, you know, and that's supposed to be, you know, A-L-E-X-A, do this. Um, design was really thought I, – I, I, as we see these evolve, um, I am really kind of impressed with the thought that's going into the interface, which is something I really don't say very often about any product associated with Google, but of course this is from Lenovo, just using the you know the Google services. Um, but compared to the Echo Spot, this is so much more thoughtful because the Echo Spot was kind of like, yeah, you're going to put it next to your bed, and there's a video camera, and isn't that creepy, boys and girls? But there's no camera built into this. Um, it's it well, actually you know has some. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll buy one and tear it down just to prove that. Um, that would be a fun video. I, I just, uh, you know, you know, I, there's moments where I, I, I tend to not want a lot of technology in certain parts of my house. Uh, for example, the kitchen. Um, but, you know, the gradual wake up alarms on this, uh, you know, uh, I love the fact that, you know, as much as I don't want to deal with a coffee maker uh, that is smart, uh, it will automatically turn on your coffee maker. You can actually check the security cameras on your front door off of this. You can check, 
you know, the kitty cameras, the baby cameras off of this. Um, you know, the, at this point, uh, Google's ecosystem has gotten so dense that there's like 10,000 products and 1,000 brands. And it's been really interesting to watch uh, Google play catch up with Amazon's ALEXA environment uh, and how quick they've done. The pricing on this is also really good. You're talking about like $80 for this, and uh, yeah. which is uh, a quite reasonable spot, I think, for it. Um, you know, especially when you when you think about the price that the uh, spot came out of. You know, and it's like one hundred thirty dollars right now. And the round screen was cute, but I don't think it was particularly useful. Um, I don't know. It's uh, going to be available uh, spring twenty nineteen. Again, the price is going to be eighty dollars on that. And uh, uh, if you're thinking about something to control your home automation gear, your 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 a Google Assistant uh, that you aren't uncomfortable or you, that you're comfortable with in your bedroom. I think it's it's got strong possibilities. I also want to tell Google to quit counting uh, every single Android phone ever uh, that loads Google Assistant as being a Google Assistant. Um, but that's a personal gripe. <laughs> we don't need to get too deep into on this one. Yeah. Um, but just and, back to and, your you know, original point about like the the fact that they're sort of merging the voice assistant functionality with tactile like actual physical touch buttons that's a that's a good idea especially for a product like this where yeah you know people just have it ingrained in their heads how they interact with a mm -hmm. alarm clock in their bedroom so why not it's have a it natural work that way you know if i gave one of these to my mom it would it would kind of fit in quite nicely with the thunk that she's been doing with alarm clocks for decades I, you know it felt good in the hand which is something it's been really a lot of the you know Amazon's getting a little bit better, but it's certainly uh, a lot of the Echo products you know were classic, aesthetically challenged black plastic whatevers, uh, you know prisms or, or or spears, but there or or cylinders. But uh, you know to have it's a nicely textured object. You know the the volume control buttons are you know they have just a little bit of style to them. It feels good in the hand. It kind of blends. You know, hey, it's gray fabric. It's like Google or any of a number of umpteen other, you know, uh, Etsy-ish faux wool covered devices out there. Um, another thing Lenovo had, we didn't talk about this last week. I was really impressed by the Yoga A940 uh, as something that, that might be a, uh, a surface killer. Big 27-inch uh, 4K screen. Um, Super, super bright, accurate colors. Uh, what's kind of crazy is looking at the base of that, if you can see that picture at the top, is it folds down to about 25 degrees, so it folds flat like a tablet, comes with a stylus. Uh, you can rack the, you can put the keyboard and the mouse up on that little table. Uh, the keyboard goes on the left over most of the guts of the system, but the right side where the mouse is is also a wireless charging pad for your phone. Um, but you can't quite see it. Uh, until you scroll down, um, they have uh, a really cool dial that's attached to this one. And it is, you know, Shannon kind of, it's funny, Shannon's not a big fan of all-in-ones. I love all-in-ones. Uh, so I'm looking at this because I look at all the all-in-ones because I love them. They're wonderful. Um, but that precision dial that sticks out of the side there, it's got two dials and a button on that and some really deep, integration into Adobe's creative suite and for content creators it's really thoughtful because not only is it it you know they're working with Adobe to give it lots of functionality and customizability so if you're sliding through brushes or sizes or scaling or you know tweaking photos or videos um, it also is a USB device that you can pull out of the left side of the monitor and stick into the right side of the monitor mm. and uh uh, you Which know, I just you know, thought, yeah, but I mean, both handedness. Yes. <laughs> it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I thought it was a nice detail on that. Um, eighth gen, you know, six core processor going to be on that Radeon uh, RX 560, which is, I think a little bit behind what the offerings are on, uh, the surface pro, uh, all in ones. Uh, but certainly it's going to do you better than the stock Intel graphics. Um, yeah. It's kind of somewhere Not in between a Surface Pro and like an iMac, where the iMac yeah. has the Radeon like 500 series graphics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be selling for around two thousand dollars, but uh, you know, it's it was really 
you know, I've seen a lot of stuff that's like dedicated to content creators, but this actually seemed like they may have actually talked to some content creators about what irritated them about various devices in their life before they built this. Um, <laughs> Plus, let's face is, it, uh, the younger generation, and I'm thinking of my three-year-old son uh, here. Right. They're just not going to accept computers, I don't think, that don't have some sort of full touch interface. Uh, so when he's off to school, something like this, if he's learning like how to you know, create art on a computer, that's going to make so much sense to him to just grab it, hold it down, grab a pen, and start doing things on the screen. And this kind of form factor is pretty much where you have to go with all-in-ones to make it work both ways. And I've, I know I've seen concepts in the past of like, well, this is what Apple could do with a touch iMac. Well, they haven't done it. And this is another example of one of those products that can be used in a traditional way or can be used with a stylus or your fingertip. And, you know, obviously these are geared towards that content creator side, but, you know, that's, that's a pretty big market and <laughs> it. If that display looks really good, I did not get a chance to see this, but if that display looks good, that is a pretty compelling product. If you're going side by side with another all-in-one like an iMac, which is, you know, it's just a display up on a stand mm -hmm. that happens to have the computer behind it. So I'll, I'll be really curious to see uh, what the, you know, I, I want to see somebody measure this when it finally comes out, but it, uh, um, you know, they're working with Dolby Vision HDR, not too deep. Uh, I don't think we had the color gamut. Oh, you know, now it's up here now. 100% uh, RGB with Dolby Vision. Um, they didn't have too much information on the color gamma or the brightness of the screen when we were taking a look at it. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important. You may think Facebook, Instagram, but you know what? Sometimes the audience changes. The audience leaves a social platform. But if you have a domain name, oh, it's the first, it's the biggest step to building your personal brand online, one that lasts. Hover celebrating their 10th anniversary with never-before-seen sales. Hurry over and check them out. Every couple days, they'll be highlighting a new promotion, including $10.coms, $10 small mailbox registrations, and more. The sale begins January 16th, and the last promotion will end on January 30th. Hover features the best-in-class customer support team. No upsells. And just having no upsells is a huge, huge thing if you've ever shopped for a domain name and went through 22 pages of additional stuff they wanted to sell you. The user experience is clean. The interface is simple. Hover Connect allows you to connect your domain name with many different types of website builders and CMSs. You can add as many mailboxes as you want to any domain. There's a forwarding feature for only $5 a year. There's a prorated cost, so it renews alongside your domain, so you don't have to pay for a full year and just get a couple months. It's reliable. It's inexpensive. It's nice. Hover, our go-to domain name provider, will be celebrating their 10-year anniversary this January. So check out their promo starting January 16th. Watch their website and social channels to see when these offers go live. Kick off 2019 with a domain name from Hover. Visit hover.com slash 10 years to take advantage of their 10th anniversary sale. That's hover.com slash 10 years, hover.com slash 10 years. And we thank Hover for their support of This weekend Computer Hardware. Cortana and Search. It's just being torn it's apart. not working out. Yeah, they needed some space, <laughs> and they went to the developers, and they've come up with, you know, what they think might be a good compromise. It's it's. <laughs> uh, I saw Mary Jo Foley tweet about this, so I went to the Microsoft blogs, and first of all, if you're viewing this, you see one of the most impressive graphics I've ever seen. This is the actual graphic that Microsoft published to show you the separation of Search and Cortana. <laughs> with what looks like Microsoft Paint and yellow text and arrows that were drawn by hand. So, uh, Insider Preview Build 18317 is is the one. And I, I find this very interesting, per, mostly because I am something of like a... I, I, let's just say I, I'm not a big fan of Cortana. And the fact that you can't actually fully disable Cortana. And you there are, are means that people Windows go 10. through. What's that? That you can't rip it out of Windows 10 with extreme prejudice or just merely make no. it go away? 
Yeah, I mean, that my real complaint of like, Windows 10 is a fine operating system in many ways, and it's it's one of those things where we're kind of being forced into it as new hardware comes out. Like, I can't take advantage right. of modern graphics and DirectX 12 without being on Windows 10, and that's where enthusiasts will go, and mainstream users too, as computers are sold exclusively with Windows 10 now, for the most part. But uh, Cortana is not everyone's favorite, and being tied into Microsoft services is not everyone's first choice, although they would love it if it right. was. So separating it from the Windows search experience is a good first step. Now, I would love it if disabling it will actually work, and I don't have it running as a background process all the time. But we, we will see. I'm not on this build. I haven't done any testing yet. But uh, the first thing I thought of was... Maybe going through the steps that you have to go through to completely rip Cortana out of the system won't take Windows Search along with it now. But we'll see. Because there are, there are some not so easy processes and some fairly painless processes to disable the things you don't like about Windows 10. And that was one of those things where, well, if you take Cortana away, then you don't have Windows Search anymore. So then you have to install a third-party search tool and, and everything else. So uh, yeah, nice I to just, see get, at least separation, I guess. That's a start. I, I just yeah. get frustrated every time I, I, I install a Windows update and it reinstalls OneDrive on my computer. Yes. Um, yes. It installs things you don't necessarily want it to install. It also has this wonderful habit of installing drivers that you you wanted to be on a specific driver version for a reason or you install new... This is what works. I always run into. I forget and leave a system running online. Install a new piece of hardware. Go to install a specific driver and it's already installed a different driver just because it was connected to the internet. And it was just like, oh, it's being helpful. Like, that's not really helpful to me, but I guess I'm in the minority there. And it's something that can be turned off. Although I have noticed even turning it off doesn't always work. That's the sort of scary part about Windows 10 is that you can change settings, but did you really change them or did you just get the peace of mind of changing a slider? <laughs> I'm still... I had uh, I had delayed a Windows 10 upgrade, uh, which unfortunately happened during the middle of a multi gigabyte upload uh, to Dropbox from CES no, no. earlier. Oh no! So, yeah, it's like oh, that's great. At least it gave you the option of delaying. That's nice. Yes, the problem is it never gives me the option of delaying long enough. Apparently, but I love Windows 10 for the most part. But it it would be nice to have uh, a more Linux like level of control over individual features. Although, you know, Linux can be emotionally terrifying if you uh, get too deep yeah. in the settings. I generally don't look at coolers, or at least not since the early days of the Zalman Copper coolers, look at a cooler and think, that's really cool. Um, sorry for the pun, but uh, moders-inc.com is a nice review of the new Cooler Master, Master Air G100M, which if you scroll down a little bit, and squint on the left side of that screen if uh, you're watching the video. I really liked the design of this. It looks um, like a like a concept for like a a football or baseball stadium. Yeah, absolutely. or maybe it's like Apple's Apple's campus, the new. Uh, <laughs> you can now see the sub basements of Apple's campus, <laughs> including the hidden executive level. Why isn't all the copper. parking down there below the building too? <laughs> it's. It's the, the craziest thing, thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Someday we'll have to try to sneak into it, see if we can get arrested. Um, so they're talking about 130 watt cooling capacity, uh, and what they did is is they have what they call a heat column at the center of the cooler, which basically means there's an outside, there's an inside filled with fins, and the fan pulls the air through the inside, creating a uh, column of heat, uh, much like a chimney. <laughs> um, not or uh, like not the uh, 2013 Apple Mac Pro. Yes. You know, you, you have all the heat in the center and you pull it up out of the top. Use convection. <laughs> for your definitely, uh, based on the review, definitely not something you want to use for uh, a, a serious overclocking system. It just doesn't have the thermal capacity. But if you've got a small, any, uh, a small mini ITX case and you want something that's aesthetically pleasing and fairly small, I think the, the, the depth on this is 25 millimeters total. Um, it'll do you just fine. Not that again, is though. crazy. 25 millimeters. Yeah. Okay. That is very, very low. If, uh, if I read the specs right, yeah, it's about an yeah, inch. It is. I, 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 so it's one of the shorter ones I've seen. I think I've seen as low as like 23, but those are the yeah. ultra low profile. And 
Yeah, that's and at that point, yeah, you're not you're not overclocking the system if you're going that low. <laughs> but this thing is cool looking. Like it, I mean, the RGB is just kind of the icing on the cake if you're into RGB stuff. That is no, it's you know, if you've I, seen as most gotta, of the low profile cooler, coolers on the market, they're pretty uninspiring. From a design standpoint, the Noctua so. one is brown. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You can stand out because of those you have a brown my, one. I have a, I have one of those in my mini ITX system. Um, that one's actually interesting because they they managed to put a massive chunk of copper on that, and then they they bring the fins out kind of to the side with the fan over them, so it creates more cooling than you would expect. But it can be kind of awkward to fit in some cases. Um, but uh, another option out there for you. And a particularly stylish one, uh, if you're not overclocking. I just want to give a shout-out to that. Uh, head over to the nice folk at modders-inc.com to get the full review on that. And uh, a moment of sadness. It's been popping up and down. Um, but Google confirmed it uh, last week. They have officially killed off one of my favorite and, I will say, late audio discoveries. The Chromecast audio has been end of life. Or as they like to put it, we have other things that can do that. They don't do it as cheaply. They don't do it as well. And uh, I'll have to explore some of the other options. But uh, part of what was fantastic about this is the, the onboard DAC is fine. It's not great, but it's good. Uh, but you could use uh, that 3.5 millimeter jack as also an optical jack, and you could connect it to an outboard DAC. And it was about the least painful way to stream audio, including using it as a rune endpoint to your, uh, you know, if you had sort of a more high-end system or if you wanted to make it super easy to stream uh, music to your DAC and your headphone amp or something like that. Uh, I think they're cool. The audio performance, especially over the optical connection, is pretty outstanding. They're selling them for 15 bucks, which I thought was just sort of an end-of-the-year sale, but it turned out to be an MPR warehouse sale. Uh, they officially uh, shut down sales a few weeks ago, or a week ago, I want to say five days ago. Um, but, uh, like I saw it on Paul Thorat posted about it and I was like, no, it's like the one great piece of Google hardware. Um, but they keep reappearing and disappearing. So if you were thinking yeah, about buying one night, last night, it popped up for me and I see, of course, today it says out of stock again. <laughs> I wonder if it's just out of stock for good now. I didn't pull the trigger when I could have, and now I've, I've missed out. Well, Maybe. You know, I, I, they were, they, they showed up the day after they were quote sold out. Uh, then they disappeared for a couple of days and they showed up again. So if I see one, I'll let you know. So, oh my goodness. Any, uh, of course, 2060 final benchmark results are, uh, are showing up at PC per as soon as you're done analyzing, which, uh, hopefully will not be emotionally traumatizing. Do you have a lot more testing to do or are you fully in the analysis phase at this point? Uh, I've got a little bit more testing to do because I had to go through all the other cards again. That was the sad thing about the timing and with CES is I, I was cutting corners and doing just the two resolutions that I reviewed and then I have to go back and fill it in with the 1440 stuff, which is interesting. Like that's, that's really a sweet spot for a lot of enthusiasts, especially with the high refresh panels and stuff that are at 1440. So, and then... Uh, EVGA was nice enough to, uh, to provide a couple of products for our review. And we have that new audio card that we talked about last week. It's actually behind me. You can see it on the back corner of the desk there. And they also sent a, a variant of the RTX 2060, which has a pretty hefty factory overclock right out of the box. So mm -hmm. that's all going to be kind of incorporated into my overclocking testing. So that's what's coming up is the 1440 update overclocking with that card. Uh, check out the new high-end card from EVGA and maybe a little bit more stuff that we have uh, in the works at PCPro.com. Oh, my goodness. Uh, of a tech thing, we uh, we posted 24 more products from CES 2019 today, uh, including a whole bunch of gaming gear uh, from uh, HyperX and Corsair. And we talked about that Lenovo Yoga, Lenovo Yoga A940 and several other things. So if you are looking for, for example, an Amazon ALEXA enabled uh, mini computer, we've got that. The Lumen metabolism sensor, uh, you breathe, it measures your CO2 output, uh, and it gives you an idea of how many calories you're burning. Um, lots and lots of stuff, including the latest round of arcade, three-quarter scale arcade cabinets from uh, one Up, Mural Canvas. I found a Wi-Fi 6 router that is currently shipping. 
Um, not the ultimate NATO 211AX performance, uh, but I will be very curious to see if anybody can benchmark NATO 211AX performance as actual endpoint cards or chipsets with NATO 211AX built in start showing up. So I also talk about the stories behind the scenes where people are talking about 5G. I feel comfortable in saying, feel free to take your time investing in 5G hardware. I'll leave that there. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't have to go into, and you know, we talked about uh, the 5G thing with AT&T last week. And I was thinking, you know, are they really going to market it? Like, oh, and then I'm watching TV and yes, there are TV commercials proclaiming, you know, just okay isn't okay. And I'm thinking just okay is exactly what 5GE is. So <laughs> it's, it's exactly amazing the same. what they could do with marketing. You know, it's like, if you're willing to stretch the truth just a little bit farther. Well, it's not 5G. It's 5GE, which is a marketing concept we came up with to promote 4G. Like it's 5G. But without lying. Don't tell the Federal Trade Commission. We're not lying. It makes me, it, it just immediately reminded me of QLED versus OLED and how, you know, the average person looking at Best Buy sees the big O LED and then there's the Samsung box. It, it's Is that an O? I guess it's a Q, but I mean, it looks like an O. <laughs> QLED and OLED, what's the difference? Oh, I don't even want to touch that right now. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, if you've never heard this podcast before, this is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, and uh, you're listening to it on twit.tv slash twitch. Or I should say, if you want to get all the older episodes or information on how to subscribe, go to twit.tv slash twich. I'm Patrick Norton. I make a website, make a website, make a web show, make a couple of web shows, <laughs> techthing.com, T-E-K-H-I-N-G.com, and AVXL. And uh, if you haven't been there, ladies and gentlemen, go over to Sebastian's website, pcper.com, and avail yourself of the glories of the hardware testing you'll find there, including just as soon as... Sebastian's done his final review of NVIDIA's RTX 2060. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it will be the best review ever written. Yeah, I mean, it'll be worth the wait for sure. I've dragged this thing out about as far as I can, so I've, I've got to get it in gear and get it done before the wait. You know, there are worse things than being thorough, sir. Yeah, that's true. Also, it was a cruel time to release a card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh... You know, I, I just started as editor in chief, and then one of the first things is, oh, by the way, uh, right after Christmas and before CES, here's a major graphics card launch. Go! So surprise! But hey, it was fun. It was a lot of. Uh, it reminded me of when my son was born. You know, those those really really late nights and very <laughs> limited sleep. <laughs> But instead of waking up in the middle of the night to change or feed a baby, it was wake up and run more graphics benchmarks. Uh, I'd start singing memories, but then we'd have to pay a lot of money to somebody somewhere for the licensing right for that. So I will stop and remind everybody, twit.tv slash twitch. Thank you all for listening to this episode. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. Twitch.